Because classes can inherit from each other in the same way that country singer inherited from singer, it means one class is effectively a superset of another. Class B has all the things A has with a few extras. This in turn means that you can treat type B as a type B or a type A, depending on your needs. If you're confused, let's try some code. I'll make a new class called album and say this thing has a single property called name, an initializer that takes a name string and does self.name equals name, ends initializer, ends a class. Then we'll make another one called studio album that inherits from album. In here we'll have a studio name string plus initializer takes a name string and a studio string. It assigns a studio property straight away. Studio equals name, uh, studio, sorry. Then end initializer. But of course we must inside there call super.init with a name to pass it on to our super class so we can set its property. Then end that class. And let's make one more. I'll call this thing a uh, class live album, inherits from album. This thing has a location where it took place. Again, it's a string. So I'll say init name string, location string, self.location equals location. And of course, again, super.init with the name value that came in, like that. So that's defining three classes. Regular albums up here, then studio albums, then live albums. With the latter two, both inheriting from album. Now because any instance of live album is inherited from album, it can be treated as either album or live album. It's both at the same time. This is called polymorphism, but it means you can write code like this. Var Taylor Swift equals a studio album with the name Taylor Swift, uh, in quotes of course, and the studio, the castles, Studio and Fearless equals a studio album with the name uh, Speak Now or Fearless even 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 more sensibly. Uh, the studio, of course, is Amy Land Studio and iTunes Live. That's a live album with the name being iTunes Live from Soho. The location there was New York. And we can now group those three together into a single array. We'll say var all albums is an array of album as Taylor Swift, Fearless, and iTunes Live. So there we create an array that holds only albums, but put inside it two studio albums and a live album. This is perfectly fine in Swift they are all descended from the album class, so they share the same basic behavior. We can push this a step further to really demonstrate how polymorphism works. Let's add a get performance method to all three classes. So for our album thing, we will say func get performance returns a string, and then we'll say uh, return the album string interpolation name sold lots. Then for the studio album, we'll say override func, so changing the existing get performance method in our superclass. Get performance returns a string. Oops, a string, not a scheduling. Return the studio album name sold lots. End that. And then further down in our live album, we will say override func get performance. Turn the string, return the live album. New uh, string interpolation, name, sold lots. So the get performance method exists in the album class, but both child classes override it. When we create an array that holds albums, we're actually filling it with subclasses of albums, live album and studio album. They go into the array just fine because they inherit from the album class, but they never lose their original class. 
So we could write code like this. For album in all albums, print album dot get performance. Now we'll automatically use the override version of get performance depending on the subclass in question, and that's polymorphism in action. An object can work as its class and its parent classes all at the same time. You'll often find you have an object of a certain type, but really you know it's a different type. Sadly, if Swift doesn't know what you know, it won't build your code. So there's a solution, and it's called typecasting, converting an object of one type to another. Now, if you're struggling to think of why this might be necessary, I can give you a very simple example. We have one right here in our loop. This all albums array holds the type album, but we know that really it's holding one of the subclasses, studio album or live album. Swift doesn't know that. So if you try to write something like print album.studio, it will refuse to build because only studio album objects have that property, and it thinks we have regular albums. Typecasting in Swift comes in three forms, but most of the time you'll only meet two as question mark and as exclamation mark known as optional downcasting and forced downcasting. The former means I think this conversion might be true, but it might fail. And the second means I know this conversion is true and I'm happy for my app to crash if I'm wrong. Now when I say conversion, I don't mean the object literally gets transformed, instead it's just converting how Swift treats the object. You're telling Swift that an object it thought was type A is actually type E. The question and exclamation marks should give you a hint of what's going on, because this is a very similar thing to optional territory. For example, if we had in here for album in all albums, let studio album equals album as question mark studio album, Swift will make studio album have that as type optional studio album, studio album question mark. That is, an optional studio album. The conversion might have worked, in which case you have a studio album you can work with, or it might have failed, in which case you have nil. This is most commonly used with if let to automatically unwrap the optional result. So let's go back to our code from before, print album.get performance, and then say uh, if let studio album equals album as question mark studio album print studio album dot studio else if let live album equals album as question mark live album print studio album oh, live album even album dot location so that will go through every album and print its performance details because that's common to the album class and all its subclasses it then checks whether it can convert the album value into a studio album, and if it can, it prints out studio name. The same thing's done for its live album and its location. Force downcasting is when you're really sure an object of one type can be treated like a different type. But if you're wrong, your program will crash. Force downcasting doesn't need to return an optional value because you're saying the conversion is definitely going to work. And if you're wrong, it means you wrote your code wrong. To demonstrate this in a non-crashy way, Let's strip out the live albums so we have only studio albums. So I'll take out, at the end, iTunes Live. It's still an array of album, as far as Swift's concerned, but we now know they're actually all studio albums. So inside the loop, I'm going to say, let studio album equals album as exclamation mark studio album, print studio album dot studio. That's obviously a contrived example, because if that were really your code, you would just change all albums so it had the type studio album array rather than album array. Still, it shows how forced downcasting works, and the example won't crash because it makes the correct assumptions. Swift lets you downcast as part of the array loop, which in this case would be more efficient. If you wanted to write that forced downcast at the array level, you'd write something like this, for album in all albums as exclamation mark studio album. You could then say immediately inside the loop, print album.studio, because it must at this point be a studio album. 
so it no longer needs to downcast every item inside the loop because it happens when the loop begins. Again, you had better be correct that all items in the array are studio albums, otherwise your code will crash. Swift also allows optional downcasting at the array level, although it's a bit more tricksy because you need to use the nil coalescing operator to ensure it's always a value for the loop. For example, you might say something like this, uh, for album in all albums, as question mark, live album, then nil coalescing, a uh, live album array, like that, a new one, empty one, we can do print album dot location. What that means is, try to convert all albums to be an array of live album objects, but if that fails, just create an empty array of live albums and use that instead, i.e. do nothing. Typecasting is useful when you know something that Swift doesn't know. For example, when you have an object of type A that Swift thinks is actually type B. However, typecasting is useful only when those types really are what you say. You can't force a type A into a type F if they aren't actually related. For example, if you have an integer called number, you couldn't write code like this to make it a string. Let number equals five, let text equals number equals number, force typecast string. That is, you can't force an integer into a string because they're two completely different types. Instead, you need to create a new string by feeding it the integer, and Swift knows how to convert the two. The difference is subtle. This is a new value rather than just a reinterpretation of the same value. So that code should be written like this. Let text equals string number. And now you can do print text. This only works for some of Swift's built-in types. You can convert integers and floats to strings and back again, for example. But if you create two custom structs, Swift can't somehow magically convert one to the other. You've got to write that code yourself.